Up to then, the kidnap murder and the post office killings had been investigated separately, without overall coordination. A bitter Ronald Whittle now revealed the details of his abortive attempt to pay the ransom money. It wasn't just a matter of getting lost. I got slightly lost. That wasn't a long delay. What was a delay was, first of all, the uh, delay in finding the message in the, in the telephone box, which was over a quarter of an hour. And then the, the instructions at the end were not clear. The wall where I was supposed to stop, I didn't even see in my headlights. We shall never know for certain, but I feel rightly or wrongly, that the way in which this was revealed in the press in the early days could quite easily have me meant a quicker death than might have been for Leslie. On the platform, or in the park, the police had found another tape recorder, a sleeping bag with labels which raised hopes of identification. A flash lamp, binoculars, and a foam rubber mattress identical to the one found in the stolen Morris. More than 800 police were now assigned to the combined inquiry. Serial numbers and names and addresses given for guarantees were being tracked down, but all the promising leads came to nothing. Recordings of the ransom demands were played on radio and television in the hope that someone might recognize the voice. The public responded only too eagerly, and more than a thousand people phoned in after a reconstruction of the events was shown on television. Several different identikit pictures were released. None of them, it later turned out, looked much like the Black Panther. Chief Superintendent Booth sounded increasingly distraught. How evil, how ruthless, how terribly wicked this man is that we've hunted for seven weeks. God above, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams he'd do such a thing to a girl. It's... It, it's, it's terrible. Within 24 hours we'll have him if it means pulling every stuff out in creation. Unfortunately, Staffordshire have our body. But we want the murderer. I don't care where he's arrested, I don't care by who he's arrested. We'll cooperate with anybody. But the hunt for that man is from here. These people have been working since November, since he came down to Langley and shot somebody. They've been working after that since he shot Mr. Smith. And I've been working non-stop with them for nearly 24 hours every day for seven weeks. And we'll work until we get him. And if we don't get him today, we'll get him tomorrow. But eight more months passed. And despite such attempts as dressing up an actor in clothes the Panther was known to have worn, and filming him in Kidsgrove and Bathpool Park, all efforts drew a blank. Meanwhile, stolen postal orders were being cashed all round the north of England and newspapers published maps of where the Black Panther was known to have been. But the truth was that despite all the publicity and the huge police operation which interviewed more than 60,000 people, they were no nearer to catching him. Worse still, there were several unsuccessful attempts at copycat crimes. Fortunately, all the intended kidnaps came to nothing, but the Home Office was seriously worried. Then, on the 11th of December, 1975, came the vital break. Two constables, Stuart Mackenzie and Anthony White, stopped a man carrying a hold-all near a sub-post office in Mansfield, Nottingham. He produced a sawn-off shotgun and forced them to drive to a nearby village. As they slowed in the village, PC White grabbed at the gun. Mackenzie braked and it went off, injuring White's hand. Two customers from a nearby fish and chip shop, Roy Morris and Keith Wood, ran to help, and the gunman was subdued after a struggle. As the battered suspect was arrested, the police examined the bag he had been carrying. In it were two Black Panther masks and other incriminating evidence. At first, the man refused even to identify himself, but he was driven to Kidsgrove, and after 12 hours of intensive questioning, 
his resistance began to crack, and he gave his name as Donald Nielsen, a self-employed decorator from Bradford. Within minutes, police raided Nielsen's house at Grangefield Avenue, Thornaby, Bradford. In a locked attic, they found an extraordinary collection of weaponry and equipment. Faced with this evidence, Donald Nielsen finally admitted to the kidnapping of Leslie Whittle and the shootings of the sub-postmasters. His weaponry included a sawn-off shotgun, a .22 rifle with telescopic sights, crossbows, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. There were also rolls of wire, like that used to hang Leslie Whittle. The committal of Donald Nielsen took place at Kidsgrove on the 30th of March, 1976. He claimed that all the murders had been accidents. But as his story emerged, it became clear that he was an unscrupulous liar and remorseless about the damage he caused. An unloved child whose mother died when he was 10, he was constantly picked on at school because of his real surname, Nappy, a name which no schoolboy could resist teasing him about. National service made him obsessed with fitness and action, and when his businesses collapsed, he turned to armed robbery. When the sub-post offices failed to yield enough money, the report of Leslie Whittle's inheritance gave him the idea for a kidnapping. He spent three years planning and training for it. Hundreds of people waited outside the court to see what he looked like and an angry spectator made a rush at him. <laughs> Public anger was such that it was felt that Nielsen would not receive a fair trial in the north of England. So he was sent to be tried for both the murder of Leslie Whittle and the shootings of the sub-postmasters at the Crown Court in Oxford on the 14th of June, 1976. There it was hoped that an unprejudiced jury could be found. The decision to hold the trial in Oxford paid off and there was only a small crowd as it began. The trial lasted three weeks and Nielsen pleaded guilty to the kidnapping of Leslie Whittle and demanding a £50,000 ransom. But the judge, Mr Justice Mars Jones, heard him claim to be not guilty of murder, since in the case of each of the sub-postmasters his gun had gone off by mistake, and Leslie had fallen accidentally from the platform on which he had tethered her with the wire noose. The prosecution pressed Nielsen to explain why he had put the noose round her neck rather than a limb if he had not been ready to kill her. From Nielsen's evidence it became possible to reconstruct what happened on the night of the kidnap and the following days. Dressed completely in black and wearing a hood, he forced the door and left his ransom messages in the lounge downstairs. Then he crept silently upstairs and woke Leslie at gunpoint. Allowing her to put on only a dressing gown, he forced her downstairs and into the stolen Morris. Gagged and blindfolded, she lay on the back seat hidden under the foam rubber mattress for the 65-mile drive to Bathpool Park. Once there, the panther led his victim to the main drainage shaft and forced her down the iron ladder. On the platform, he put a wire noose around her neck, clamping it with three metal clips, which he tightened with a spanner. The next day, he forced her to make the tape-recorded messages, which were used to set up the various ransom trails.
One of these was intended to lead to the freight depot at Dudley, and it was while he was checking arrangements for the dropping of the money that Nielsen was surprised by the security guard whom he shot. It was because of this he arranged the alternative rendezvous in Bathpool Park. He was waiting there at 2 o'clock in the morning of the 16th of January for a car to turn up. One did, but drove off after a short time, leaving him angry and convinced that a police trap was being set. In fact, it was a courting couple who had blundered in by chance. He raced back to the drainage shaft. He claimed that as he got down to the platform, Leslie Whittle moved to give him room and accidentally fell off the ledge to her death. The prosecution claimed that he had panicked and pushed her off. The jury agreed and found him guilty. On July the 21st, 1976, Donald Nielsen was convicted of the murder of Leslie Whittle. Sentencing him to life imprisonment, the judge emphasized, in your case, life must mean life. <laughs>